mind and body can't be separated. So my emotional states have an impact on my physiology. Why? Because of the emotional centers in my brain, my nervous system, my immune system, and my hormonal apparatus are not separate systems. It's one super system. They're not connected. It's more than that. They're one. So when I repress anger, I'm actually affecting my immune system. Now, people who get chronically ill, I notice certain characteristics um, in family practice. And this has been researched by others as well, so I'm not making this up. I, when I saw it, I, I had no basis for it because nobody told me this, but then I realized, found out there was a lot of research as well. People who are, tend to be compulsively looking after the emotional needs of others and ignoring their own, People who are identified with their duty and role and responsibility rather than also the needs of the self. People who repress their healthy anger. There was a study in the States not that long ago that looked at 2,000 women over 10 years. Those women that were unhappily married and didn't talk about it were four times as likely to die as those women who were unhappily married and did express their emotions. So the issue wasn't happiness or unhappiness. The issue was, did they express it? Because, because the immune system is connected to the emotions. When you're repressing your emotions, you're also repressing your immune system in certain ways. Now, the final characteristic is people who believe that A, they're responsible for other people feel, and B, they must never disappoint anybody. Now, if you look at this culture, between the two major genders, which is the one that's programmed by this particular culture to take care of others emotionally while ignoring their own needs, including their spouses? Which, which is the ones who are told to identify with their duties rather than the needs of the self? Which is the one that is taught not to be angry, they must repress their anger? And which is the one that's made to feel responsible for other people feel? It's not exclusive to women, but by and large, it is women. And so that's why there's more autoimmune disease amongst women. And the more stress and the more um, social oppression uh, people experience, the greater the risk for all these conditions. So women of color are even more likely to have autoimmune disease than Caucasian women. And in Canada, where I live, indigenous women have six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis than that of somebody else. Six times. This is in a population that never used to have autoimmune disease at all. So what we're talking about is that emotions can't be separated from your physiology. You cannot be separated from your environment. And that means when you have an illness, that's not just a manifestation of pathology in a particular organ in an isolated body, but it's a manifestation of a lifelong process of a life that grew up in a certain environment, in a certain culture, in certain relationships. So to understand the source of disease, you have to look way beyond the individual organ, individual body, and look at their social situation and their emotional dynamics. That's the message in a nutshell. And so if trauma is similar to stress in that we all have varying degrees of it, whether it's big T or little t, and like stress, you, you can't eliminate it, but you can you can manage it. How do we all become better at managing our trauma? What does that look like in our day to day? Well, Justin, I wouldn't use the word manage, okay? Um, because um, I'm talking about resolving it, you know, so that it doesn't affect you the same way. Um, so there, you know, it's useful to learn stress management techniques, and there's a whole bunch of them out there, including mindfulness and so on. But I'm, I'm interested in something deeper than that, which is healing the trauma and, and resolving that. Now, for example, to go back to my disease-prone personality, those four traits that I outlined, it's a big word missing for, you know, from all of those. You know what that big word is? No. People have trouble saying no. So in this book, now, why do they have trouble saying no? Really interesting question. Because you got children, you told me before we began the recording. Uh, how old are they now? Uh, we have two girls, almost six and three and a half. Excellent. Um, what's the word they started using at age one and a half? Oh, of course, it was no. Exactly. Now, why does nature do that? 
Why did nature say, this is, this is natural, this is automatic, this is universal. This, we're programmed for it. No, why? Because um, wouldn't it be much more pleasant if nature had told the kid to say yes instead? Hey, time to put your shoes on. Yes. You know, time for supper. Yes. You know, no, it's no. Why is that? It's because nature's agenda is that we should all develop into independent human beings with our own sense of what we want and what we don't want. Our own sense of values, our own sense of, 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 of perspective on the world, our own desires. And in other words, nature wants to set a boundary between ourselves and other people's will. Otherwise, we never become independent. So nature's agenda is independence, actually. And if we don't know how to say no, our yeses don't mean anything at all. You live in Miami, you told me, if I come to Miami, invite you for coffee, and you don't know how to say no, you're going to say yes automatically. The yes is doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean you really want to be with me. You might not even like me, but you don't know how to say no. You come to Miami, invite me for coffee, I'm definitely coming. I, I got that one. But, what if, <laughs> but, that, but, but your yes is only meaningful if you, know, if you know how to say no. You get that? Of course. Yeah. Yes, okay. of course. So what's the impact on you? If, if you don't want to come to have coffee with me because you're tired or really busy or stressed about something, and if I invite you to a coffee and you don't say no, what's the impact on you afterwards? Sure, you get upset. You you, you go into that meeting, but you know you're a little bit uh, upset. You're you're upset with yourself that you said yes, and then you're you're not fully present, and maybe you're short, maybe you're angry on the drive over. Yeah, you're resentful. You you're, you're resentful. Yeah, all that has physiological impacts on your body. These aren't just thoughts in the head; these are bodily experiences, and. Uh, furthermore, you'll be tired afterwards because you're already tired to start with. And now you make yourself more tired. So not saying no has impacts on you. So why do people have trouble saying no? Here's the big question. Because they began life by na saying no. So what happened? What happened was is they got their message early in childhood that in order to be acceptable to their parents, they have to be compliant. They have to suppress their own will their own needs, their own perspective, and they have to just serve others. That's a very simplification of what I call the tension between attachment, our need to connect, and authenticity, our need to be ourselves. So that's what happens to a lot of people. So people that don't know how to say no, and they tend to be not exclusively, but largely women in the society, in order to, they learned in childhood that they mustn't be their authentic selves in order to be acceptable. And all their lives, now they have trouble saying no. If they have trouble saying no, that's going to be very stressful for them. So my intention is not just to manage the stress, but prevent it by teaching people to say no.